I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we bring you updates from across Ukraine. We discuss the ramifications of Iran's missile and drone strikes on Israel over the weekend, and we interview a team of international volunteers on volunteering during the full-scale invasion and the risks of operating close to the front lines. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody is going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from The Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Monday, the 15th of April, two years and 51 days since the full-scale invasion began. And today, I'm joined by our associate editor, Dominic Nichols, and assistant comment editor, Francis Sternley. I started by asking Dom for the latest news from Ukraine. Well, hi, David. Hi, everybody. We'll do the latest news from Ukraine, of course, and we will also later be discussing the parallels with what happened in the Gulf region over the weekend. A bit later, France is going to lead on that. But starting with Ukraine and Ukrainian forces positions along the front line have, quote, significantly worsened under intensified Russian assaults, according to General Alexander Sersky. So General Sersky, as a reminder, he's uh, commander in chief of Ukraine's military, the the head of the um, armed forces since February. He said Russia had increased its attacks since the (coughs) free and fair presidential election in uh, Moscow in March. Um, And as warmer weather has allowed more movement on the battlefield. So messaging on Telegram on Saturday, General Sersky said the situation on the Eastern Front has significantly worsened in recent days. The enemy is increasing its efforts by using new armoured vehicle units, which are periodically achieving tactical success. He went on to describe how Russia is focusing at the moment and trying to break through west of Bakhmut and Avdivka in the Donbass. He said they're using dozens of tanks in these assaults. And he went on, this is facilitated by warm, dry weather, which has made most of the open areas of the terrain accessible to tanks. Now, he posited the idea that the, the Kremlin wants to capture the town of Chasiv Yar by May the 9th, May the 9th being Russia's victory day. He said uh, measures were taken to significantly strengthen the brigades, those brigades defending Chasiv Yar, with ammunition, drones and electronic warfare equipment. He put that on Facebook, having visited the front line yesterday. Now, Chasiv Yar lies about 10 miles west of Bakhmut. Elsewhere over the weekend, Sunday, Ukrainian officials said 10 Shahid drones had attacked Kharkiv overnight Saturday, Sunday, but the uh, air defence systems there had shot them all down. Alexander Filchikov, who's Kharkiv's regions, uh, the Kharkiv region's top prosecutor, he said Russia was deliberately targeting civilians and that 97 people have been killed in Kharkiv region this year so far. Speaking to Reuters, he said the attacks are mainly aimed at intimidating the civilian population. They're trying to make people leave the city, leave their buildings, homes and apartments. The population of Kharkiv is said to have recovered to about 1.3 million. We think it had about a million at the start of the full-scale invasion, dropped down to about 300,000, back up now to 1.3 million, but is being hit on a very regular basis over the last three weeks-ish. Now, separately, Ukrainian officials said its air force had hit a command center for a Russian army group in Luhansk. General Mykola Elushuk, commander of the Ukrainian air force, said the Ukrainian pilots did an excellent job and returned to base. There will be more such attacks on enemy rear lines when Ukraine receives more missiles from our Western partners. We think he's hinting there at Storm Shadow slash Scalp. We think that was the weapon uh, used in that attack, but we can't verify that. Now, Russia has not confirmed the strike, but the War Observer Russian uh, military blog on Telegram highlighted claims that Storm Shadow missiles had been used to hit Luhansk and showed videos of huge explosion in the city. Now then, related to the attack on Kharkiv, you'll notice there's an article on, online, or in the paper over the weekend, still online, obviously, from Joe Barnes, Brussels correspondent, who said that Russian forces have been using new subsonic air-to-surface KH-69 cruise missiles. They said at least one was used to destroy the Trapilska coal-powered thermal power plant last week, about 25 miles south of Kiev. 
Um, Joe writes that the KH-69 has an improved range of about 250 miles from what they think is 190 miles-ish for the for glide bombs at the moment. Fired by fast jets more than more than the big Tupolev bombers. Major Ilya Lev- Yavlash, a spokesperson for Ukraine's Air Force, said that KH-69 missiles pose a new problem for Ukraine's depleted missile defence systems as they're very quick and easy to deploy. He said, this is Major Yevlash, said that US-supplied Patriot air defence missiles are capable of shooting them down, but uh, more are needed. Now, as well as the KH-69, the Kremlin, we know, has been firing these the glide bombs, these modified dumb bombs, in recent weeks. The proportional guidance and a GPS head gives it increased range and, and precision. Now, on to more external support for Russia. And China is said to be providing Moscow with cruise missile, drone and tank parts, fueling the biggest Russian military expansion since Soviet times. This is a warning coming from the US. Reuters reporting, citing US defence officials, who wouldn't be named, warned that China is propping up Russia's defence industrial base and funnelling weapons technology towards the war in Ukraine. Now, on Friday, a Biden administration official who was speaking on condition of anonymity accused China of helping Moscow to meet its, what he says, well, he or she says, is the most ambitious defence expansion since the Soviet era and on a faster timeline than we had believed possible early on in this conflict. The official went on, Our view is that one of the most game-changing moves available to us at this time to support Ukraine is to persuade the PRC, that's China, to stop helping Russia reconstitute its military industrial base. Russia would struggle to sustain its war effort without PRC input, the official said. Now, Beijing is also thought to have provided Russia with drone engines, cruise missile turbojet engines and nitrocellulose. That's a chemical compound used to make propellants for weapons. US intelligence suggests Chinese and Russian companies have worked jointly to produce drones inside Russia, while Chinese companies have worked to improve Russia's satellite and space-based capabilities and supplied satellite imagery for military purposes. So Reuters, quoting the official again, said that uh, 90% of Russia's microelectronics used to make missiles, tanks and aircraft currently come from China, alongside 70% of Russia's approximately 900 million US dollars of machine tooling that have been imported in the last uh, quarter of 2023. Now, they refer to Janet Yellen, U.S. Treasury Secretary, who uh, was on a visit last week and spoke to or told Chinese officials in Beijing that companies, this is a quote from Ms. Yellen, companies, including those in the PRC, must not provide material support for Russia's war and that they will face significant consequences if they do. Now, Bloomberg says that trade between China and Russia has reached a record $240 billion U.S. billion last year, 2023, as supplies of goods and materials from the West have been choked off with sanctions, but at the same time, Russia has boosted exports of coal and oil to China in response. Anthony Blinken, US Secretary of State, he's reported to have briefed European allies last week on the scope and significance of this support from China. Uh, He's expected to go to China later this month for talks. Connected, or separately, I suppose, but related, China has announced rare sanctions against two US arms makers, General Atomics, Aeronautical systems and general dynamics land systems of what Beijing called their support for arms sales to Taiwan. And just finally for me, David, I note on Saturday, Germany said it would send another US built Patriot missile defense system to Ukraine, with President Zelensky thanking Berlin, saying it came at a, a critical time for us. Um, German Defense Minister Boris Pistorius said Russian terror against Ukrainian cities and the country's infrastructure causes immeasurable suffering well quite a lot of that has been measured i think i mean germany initially rather hesitant in its support it's now ukraine's second largest military donor after the us we, we should note that although clearly their chancellor Schultz is still very reluctant to s- supply some key capabilities namely the taurus long-range missiles but on the point about long-range air attack and air defence, I will hand over to Francis, because I think we need to turn to the events in the Gulf region. But that's us up to date for now, David. Well, thank you very much, Dom Nichols. Francis, then, straight to you. Uh, It's been a very busy geopolitical weekend. Uh, Where would you like to start? Well, thanks, David. Yes, the events in the Middle East will, of course, have significant ramifications for global geopolitics, not least Ukraine, hence why I'm going to start there. 
It also, of course, poses significant questions about discordance in current Western foreign policy, many would argue. As one can imagine, world figures across the board are quick to condemn Iran's continuing actions in attacking Israel using that combination of Shahid drones and missiles. I'll start with Zelensky because his statement is the most revealing, I think, of the Ukrainian position on this. And I quote, We know very well the horror of similar attacks by Russia, which uses the same drones and Russian missiles, the same tactics of mass airstrikes. Iran's actions threaten the entire region and the world, just as Russia's actions threaten a larger conflict and the obvious collaboration between the two regimes in spreading terror must face a resolute and united response from the world. It is critical that the United States Congress make the necessary decisions to strengthen America's allies at this critical time. Now, more on that bill in Congress in a moment. But something I find quite noteworthy, which you can read in Zelensky's statement there, is the degree to which the connection between the Middle East and Ukraine is being more explicitly drawn, not just by the Ukrainians, but many other countries This time. And when I say this time, I'm comparing it to the shock and scale of October the 7th. Listeners may recall that we drew attention then to the use of drones by Hamas to disable Israeli defences before their attack, which many would argue would not have been possible without the widespread proliferation of drones in the conflict in Ukraine, with the country in essence acting as a sort of lab for new technologies which can then be used elsewhere. Indeed this time many have remarked upon the Iranian strategy of seeking to disrupt Israel's air defences by sending in cheap drones to distract those defences before then sending in the more expensive missiles. It didn't work namely because the Iron Dome is significantly more advanced and because of firepower deployed by other nations, which I'll come to in a second. But it still showed the way that war is changing as countries look at Ukraine and adapt their strategies to deploying the technologies they've developed for and with the Russians. I would posit that that is justification alone for the West to try and see the war end as decisively and as quickly and as possible in Ukraine. Now, as I say, that strategy around missiles specifically may not have worked, but the cost discrepancy, i.e. the cost of the high-tech weapons deployed to destroy those cheaper drones, has to count for something. Though the potential of that discrepancy is not yet fully understood, we can see here, I think, the potential as has been seen in Ukraine, of nations deploying swarms of drones that are cheap to produce and then being effective against very, very high-powered, expensive weapons in the sense of it costs so much to destroy the cheap drones versus the production of the drones themselves. You can imagine that if you have thousands of these things produced, that very quickly this becomes quite a major financial issue. And I know that Britain and France, just to give two examples, have found ways of shooting down drones more cheaply than they were perhaps even a few weeks ago, specifically the ones being sent over by the Houthis attacking naval shipping. But nevertheless, this is, I think, going to be a broader trend, as we've discussed in the past. Still, I think the biggest questions raised from the weekend's attack is what the differences are between Ukraine and Israel for the latter to warrant such an extensive assistance in shooting down missiles, including support from the US, Britain, Jordan, Germany and others, when Ukraine, as we've seen for two years now, evidently doesn't. After all, from Kyiv's point of view, many of those nations call Ukraine a similarly vital ally. So why the discrepancy? The obvious answer is Israel has a much longer lasting alliance with those nations. But there are other factors in play as well, which we can discuss later on. Yet fundamentally, one has to sympathise for the Ukrainians who feel a sense of betrayal, I think. I don't think that's too strong a word. As Zelensky put it afterwards, it showed that the world has everything it needs to stop Russia using Iranian drones against Ukraine after so many were downed over Israel. Not a single one of the 200 drones or cruise missiles made it 
into Israel. Only one ballistic missile, I think, hit a target that was intended, inflicting only light damage. Compare that to the frequency of successful, in inverted commas, bombardments that do land in Ukraine, killing civilians, knocking out infrastructure. I read somewhere that that huge Iranian attack we're all talking about had no more projectiles than Ukraine sees in a week. So I think we do see an obvious discrepancy here, which is hard to explain just purely in a rational sense, at least in the European context, I think. And that's the point. Another downside for Kyiv is that it once again distracts from the urgency of their cause, though it may and I emphasise that word, have an unforeseen positive effect in the form of the military aid package trapped in Congress. As long-standing listeners will recall, that package was deliberately combined with aid for Israel by the Biden administration in an attempt to ease the more divisive support for Kyiv through, though it obviously failed. Still, there are rumours swirling that it has re-injected a sense of urgency into the Republican Party, and we might see some movements this week on the bill as a result. Trump made a public statement that he could consider loans for Ukraine, which would mark a shift, though it would also oblige changes to the bill and a return vote to the Senate. So watch this space. We've been burned before, but this might, the incidents at the weekend, might serve as an impetus for Washington to get things moving. Now, more on the Middle East in a moment, and I know it's the topic for tonight's episode of our sister podcast, Battle Lines, as well. But before I finish this section, it's been a while since Francophile Francis has made an appearance. We should really um, get a jingle for this, perhaps a, an accordion. Uh, but I wanted to, to bring up France today as a bizarre proposal has been suggested by President Macron, leading to some commentary and confusion. So according to the Kiev Independent, France hopes to enlist the help of China in creating a moment of diplomatic peace in Ukraine and the Middle East during the Olympic Games in Paris this summer. Now, I don't mention this because it's an opportunity to touch on my favourite subject of ancient history, though for those who aren't aware, the Olympic truce in ancient Greece allowed the safe passage of athletes to and from the Games. Did you know that, Dom? No. Yeah, it's great stuff. It's fascinating. But because of what it tells us instead about French concerns over disruptions triggered by Moscow, as we've previously discussed, and unfortunately, potential evidence of that, how do we put it, idealistic naivety within the Elysee. For as we were discussing only last week, any frozen conflict, if indeed that's what Macron was suggesting, it's not quite clear, would likely favour Russia, not Ukraine, putting it fundamentally at odds with increased French hawkishness in relation to the conflict. So an interesting proposal, one that no doubt will lead to even more comment in the coming days and weeks. I mention it here because I do, as I say, find it slightly surreal given other things that Macron has said but whenever we hear stories like this I have to say David I do wonder whether my beret might be slipping a bit well thank you very much Francis um Francis there you brought up quite a few of the issues swirling around the Iranian drone and missile attack on Israel over the weekend Dom would you like to add your thoughts to that yeah I will do David I mean it there are many parallels but we should be very cautious about drawing too many lessons I think. Firstly, let's have a look at the geography. So the distance between where Russia is firing missiles, drones, munitions at Ukraine from, either from Russia, which obviously has a land border and a sea border with Ukraine, and also from areas inside Ukraine, is entirely different from Iran firing at Israel. So with greater distance, enables a much greater layered air defence. So France is just talking about the Israeli Iron Dome and other air defence systems, that bubble, that final layer of support, if you like. But like any good defence, there should be layers going out as far as you can possibly reach. And that was kind of what was achieved here. So if you've got US, UK, French jets and other partners, including those from the region, able to shoot down missiles, drones, all the other stuff, on their way, Jordan, obviously, well, I mean, if, if things are flying over Jordanian airspace, there's fair game for them to try you know, to bring them down. But 
you know, if you start that attritional effort hundreds of kilometers out, then it, it gives that last layer, the Iron Dome, as good as it is, and it is reportedly excellent, but gives that less work to do. You know, contrast that with what Ukraine is experiencing at the moment. And it's entirely different. There is no time. There is, there is, there's no space for a layer a defense there. And the, this idea that you could start interdicting, as in destroying the munitions or even the launch sites, be it aircraft or ground or even at sea, I suppose, inside Russia, then you're straight into this escalatory argument of, oh, no, we can't be doing that. We can't be supplying weapons that are going to be attacking these things inside Russia. So Ukraine is left with, right, brilliant. So we've got, what, three minutes from something being launched inside Russia that will hit Kharkiv, unless in, in some in some instances. So that, I mean, there's just, just not, there's just not the room here. And that layered air defence is, yeah, I use the word very guardedly, but a luxury that, that Israel had that's been denied or is denied Ukraine, but is deemed escalatory. Escalatory to what? Of course, we mean nuclear war. And the lesson here, I think, is that for all your defence ties, your defence agreements, your partnerships, your alliances, your entente cordial or, or otherwise, they're only so good as the paper there, well, sometimes not even that, Budapest Memorandum, you know, sometimes they're, you know, they're written on. So it underlines the power, as in the policy power, the psychological power of nuclear weapons. And any, I, I think this is a dangerous moment. We've talked about this before in terms of Ukraine, but I think right now, given the very, very considered and full-throated support from external allies to Israel over the weekend, what's the difference? And if you can't adequately come up with an idea to, to refute the suggestion, well, you know, it's because Russia's got nuclear weapons. That's why we're not supporting Ukraine. It underlines the power of nuclear weapons. So why shouldn't anyone else say, you know what, I can't rely on those guys. I'm just going to rely on myself. I'm going to develop nuclear weapons. So unless there is a, a very similar support now, fast, this week, this month, this moment when Russia is on the front foot in the war in Ukraine, if there's not a similar support, obvious support for Ukraine, it really does underline that in the 21st century, it's, it doesn't all come from nuclear weapons, but by God, that's doing, they're doing a, a lot of the heavy lifting. And I think if I got one more, David, I'm sort of eating into my final thoughts, but here we go. You know, escalation isn't binary. It's not like you, you do one, you either escalate or you don't. Of course, it's a, it's a sliding scale requiring very fine judgment. I don't doubt that at all. And I agree that putting NATO boots on the ground inside Ukraine, destroying Russian tanks and aircraft, so killing Russians, would be a very big and a very dangerous step. But in respect to what we saw over the weekend, how escalatory would it be to extend the existing Black Sea air policing mission by NATO? So the Black Sea policing mission, which is obviously outside Russian-Ukrainian airspace, but extend that with the rules of engagement that it already has to defend themselves if fired upon, but extend that mission to remain outside of Ukrainian airspace, if possible, but to have an additional task to shoot down air munitions heading towards Ukraine. We've already seen some missiles go past Ukraine, land in Poland, Romania. So it's not beyond the wit of man for NATO to say, you know what, we're acting in our own self-defence and we're extending the Black Sea air policing mission a little bit. You know, is this... R2P, the responsibility to protect. Do you remember that one? Responsibility to protect for the modern age, perhaps. Yes, uh, Putin would rattle his nuclear sabre as he does regularly. Yes, Medvedev would talk nukes every time he spills his drink. But would Putin seriously, seriously and actively escalate to nuclear war just in defence of t some destroyed bits of metal and microchips if it was not people, Russian people being killed. So I think this moment now, it, it, there are lessons to be drawn in many, in a whole number of ways. And I'm really worried that the two points that are going to come out of it is everybody needs to get nuclear weapons. And secondly, we're really not going to act because this power of escalation and provocation, this argument is still dominating and fixing the minds in Western slash the leaders of external support for Ukraine. And I think it's really, really worrying, David.
Well, thank you very much, Dom. Francis Durnley, would you like to come back or add anything to Dom's analysis there? I mean, it's a big moment for the Middle East, big moment for the world. And of course, there's a Ukraine angle here that you've discussed, Dom's discussed. What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I... I hate to say this, but I agree with Dom. Can't believe it. Um, oh, gosh, blimey. Um, no, I mean, I think those are the two main takeaways in many ways um, of, of what we're seeing here. And the two additional thoughts that I would add on top of them is it's not just in the Israeli conflict, is, is it? It's also in Ukraine from the very beginning that we've seen again and again the idea of nukes being in essence your trump card that enables you to get away with almost any behavior you have as long as you're willing to dangle it as a threat and the problem with that is of course is that it to dom's point encourages many other nations to begin thinking well i better get on with it and because if as soon as i get one of these i'm effectively indestructible it's a very very dangerous message to send in an increasingly febrile world but also just on that point something i think that's sometimes underappreciated is that you know we still think about these teams in, these in terms of red lines on geographic localities that are actually in certain countries so moscow tries to claim kiev because it's its neighbor is the most ob- obvious uh, example but bear in mind if you're not willing to at some point stand up to people who threaten nukes then there is really because the geography doesn't make that much of a difference when it comes to, nu- to nuclear weapons very little difference between Russia just saying, well, uh, I want to have this city and it will be a country that is not protected by nukes. And at some point you you have to decide, well, okay, if he's willing to threaten that, are we going to have to call his bluff? Because otherwise he's just going to go in there and take it. And I know this sounds rather ridiculous as a hypothetical, but I'm just meaning it as purely as an argument that if you're not willing to stand up at a certain point, then there is nothing to stop a dictator, whether it be Putin or somebody else, saying, I will use my weapon unless you give me this. We've not entered that diplomatic discussion, thank God, in since the creation of such weapons. But once you allow their proliferation and once you send a message that if you've got them, you have carte blanche, it's extremely slippery slope. And that is why, of course, the so-called nuclear umbrella is so important. The other point I just wanted to make is a shorter one, really, which is I think we're also seeing in the Israeli conflict uh, examples again with regard to the Biden administration specifically. Some of those same issues that are playing out in the Ukraine context, namely, you've got quite consistently the White House publicly, and this is the crucial point here, is I'm not saying they're wrong to do this, but I'm saying that they are publicly doing this, saying again what their red lines are in terms of their ally not doing certain things. That makes it very, very easy for America's enemies to decide their proportionality of their response and indeed to potentially make strikes they would have felt too afraid to make. One wonders whether if President Biden hadn't been as critical publicly towards Israel as he had been in the week prior to these Iranian strikes, that they would have felt brave enough to do them. And we've, of course, seen that in the Ukraine context many times, where you remember way, way, way back at the beginning, there was this sort of messaging that, you know, you can do certain things in Ukraine, but don't go over the top. It's unhelpful to articulate that if it is a negative articulation as opposed to a positive one about what your red lines are about this far and no further. And again, I know we've made this point dozens of times, but there's no point in only laying down red lines in ways that favour your enemies. And unfortunately, that has been, I think, a consistent pattern that we're seeing in various different arenas at the moment from a Western perspective. And until that changes, I think we'll continue to see certain hostile entities making more encroachments. Thank you, Francis and Dom. Well, let's leave that discussion there, I think. And of course, listeners, do let us know what you think. The email address for the podcast is in the show notes. It's a fast-moving at time, lots of new things are happening. And as Francis said, we are recording a new episode of Battle Lines, our sister podcast on global security and foreign affairs. That should come out later today on Monday. So do listen to that for the latest news and reaction to uh, the news from Israel and Iran. Let's move then now to our final thoughts. Dom Nichols. Yeah, thanks, David. So to link to all this, I do enjoy reading Phillips O'Brien. He's a professor of strategic studies at the University of St. Andrews. 
I've subscribed to his newsletter. I recommend it for everyone. The weekend newsletter, well worth a read. He's talking about the events of the weekend. I'm just going to read you a little bit of what he said, because I think it really does encapsulate an area here that we should look at. He said, the Iranian attack against a power that can actually defend itself efficiently should help put into perspective Russian power. Lately, we've been hearing again and again how powerful and and adaptive Russia is in a way that still overrates what we are seeing. The issue determining the outcome of the Russian raids on Ukraine is more Ukrainian limitations than anything else. Ukraine has old and insufficient systems and is running out of ammunition. And Russia can launch attacks against Ukraine with almost no fear of disruption. It reinforces the message that Russia can be defeated if Ukraine is armed properly. That's the end of part of Phillips O'Brien's weekly newsletter. Do go and have a look. And it does, I think that that rings true. I think everything that that we've been talking about today adds to that. And it it does, for me, right now, boil down to why did the UK, US, France and others, we think some countries in the Gulf region, choose to defend Israel from outside Israeli airspace, but won't do the same for Ukraine. And if I have the chance in the next, what time is it now? In the next 27 and a half hours to interview a British defence minister, I will be asking that question. Thank you very much, Tom. Francis Sternley, would you like the final words for today? Thanks, David. Well, we've talked about China a fair bit today. And China's support of Russia is well recorded in this war. There was certainly, I think, some hesitancy to do so at the very beginning of the conflict, as it was unclear what the likely outcome would be and economic ramifications that might be triggered by supporting Moscow. And in that vein, an interesting Chinese perspective has been published in The Economist by Feng Huion, one of China's leading Russia experts and a professor at Peking University. He argues that Russia is sure to lose in Ukraine. So a very interesting argument in this context. And the... The reasons for that are as follows. He emphasizes the level of resistance and national unity shown by the Ukrainians, the broad international support for Kyiv, Russia's failure to recover from the dramatic deastridization it suffered after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the fact that Putin is trapped in an information cocoon thanks to him being in power so long. I find that, I have to say, particularly interesting as it has, is something we've discussed in the podcast previously, namely that dictators almost always begin to believe their own delusions the longer they're in power, which, of course, impedes their decision-making. And as a consequence of all of those, he concludes as follows, that the long-term likely outcomes are that Russia will be forced, quite surprisingly, to withdraw from all occupied Ukrainian territories, including Crimea, that Russia's atomic capability is no guarantee of its success, because if one looks at the context of the United States in Vietnam, Korea, Afghanistan, it will be a similar scenario where actually you won't be able to use those weapons to bear The war, he says, is a turning point for Russia, in his view, and that it will be an example of something where the political undercurrents will continue to become more and more dangerous the longer the war goes on. The rebellion of the mercenaries of the Wagner Group being just one example, the rivalries, tensions in place in Belgorod, the ethnic tensions in certain regions, the terrorist attacks. It shows that there can be black swan events that could well lead to very different paths and very different trajectories for Russia in the coming years. And he also argues that after the war, Ukraine will have the choice to join the EU and NATO if it so wishes, while Russia is more likely to lose some of its former Soviet republics because they see Putin's aggression there as a threat to their own sovereignty and territorial integrity. So a very interesting read. We don't know of course, how representative this is of Chinese opinion. I think it needs to be very heavily caveated as a result. But if these kinds of voices, these kind of opinions are being heard in Beijing, it may, for one, explain some of the hesitancy not to fully back Moscow to the hilt. And they have not fully backed Moscow to the hilt. It's worth remembering that. As well as the potential for decoupling from Russia if the war does seriously turn sour. Thank you so much, Dom and Francis.
Now, we turn to an interview I conducted with our producer, Adelie Pojman-Ponte, in Butcher, back in March. Adelie and I spoke to the Renegade Relief Runners, a group of international volunteers based in Butcher. We discussed their work. I asked how volunteering has changed over the course of the full-scale invasion, and they told us about the kind of risks their personnel face, working so close to the front. Let's take you then to their depot in Butcher. Here's our conversation. I'm uh, Chris Tiller. I'm 32 years old, and I'm an airline pilot from the United States. I grew up in Oregon, currently domiciled in Tennessee, I guess would be the best way to put that. And I'm one of the co-founders of Renegade Relief Runners and the president of Renegade Relief Foundation in the United States. And my name is uh, Julia Bratańska. Uh, I come from Poland. I'm 20, still seven. And I'm a co-founder of Renegade Relief Runners and a founder of uh, Fundacja Lotor in Poland. And what we're looking at is this warehouse with the sort of top hole in roof and we've got huge blocks of, of aid. Uh, so loads and loads of different cardboard boxes stacked up together. Could you tell us a little bit about what, what are we looking at exactly when you say humanitarian aid? What, what is it? So we have two pallets that came in yesterday. Uh, the left one is primarily food. The right one is actually medical supplies. I actually do not know how it's called in English, but this is for when you have to feed somebody by a tube. So that's going to go to a hospital probably tomorrow or past tomorrow. All of the big pallets back there are hygiene supplies that we got donated by a Polish company. And they have graciously donated 21 pallets of hygiene supplies for us. Those all are different items. Some are basic like shampoo and soap. Some are a little more nicer, let's say, like uh, body lotion and some scrubs and stuff like that. So we are going to give them to women's shelter, IDP shelters, and some are going to go to female soldiers because those are primarily like nice cosmetics for women. And then back there, we have a palette of hand warmers, another palette of hygiene supplies, another palette of medical supplies. That is all clothes. And then in here, we have a big mix of hospital equipment and some water filter stations. In the first six weeks of 2024, we moved about 35 tons of humanitarian aid all throughout Ukraine, mostly down in Donbass, Mykolaiv region, Kherson region, Kharkiv region, either supporting local NGOs or direct hand-to-hand deliveries. So this is all stuff that just came in within the last couple of weeks as well. And we're about to buy another 10 tons of dry and canned goods to put together our meal kits that we do hand-to-hand deliveries. So we go out near the front line or in areas that have been recently liberated, especially in underrepresented communities and in places that are kind of hard to reach by conventional means. And we go out there to the villages that are left behind and distribute goods hand-to-hand. So we'll be repacking all of this into individual kits for uh, hygiene and um, doing the same with all of the packaged food into dedicated boxes and uh, handing those off to people that need them near the front line. So, Could you tell us how this group came together? Where is everybody from? You mentioned that every volunteer here has their um, origin story. Could we ask for yours? Sure, yeah. So I am an airline pilot by trade back in the United States. So I was flying for SkyWest Airlines and when the invasion broke out, I remember being at my buddy's bachelor party. It was just four of us in a cabin in Georgia and watching the newsreels of helicopters shooting civilian buildings with rockets and people screaming and running for their lives and hearing the stories about miles-long queues at the border, people panicking, trying to get across, and then they get across and they have nowhere to go. And everybody saw this invasion coming for a long time. And it was infuriating to me that I found myself watching the same stupid cross-aisle nonpartisan crap that's been happening in our politics forever and I was just I was infuriated that my country was not the first into the fight to jump in and to help even on a humanitarian level so I emailed my chief pilot and I said hey this is something I got to do and I'd really like to take a month off and go see what I can do and be helpful and when I came over here basically my entire plan was I'm going to go help out at the border. I'm going to go try to find accommodations for people and I'm going to rent a van and drive around, pull like do whatever anybody needs me to do. And so over the month of March in 2022, I kind of ended up getting involved in a lot of small logistical efforts, trying to get things over the ocean and into Ukraine from the United States. And by the time I got here, that whole problem of people not really having a place to go at the border is solved. So I just started calling everybody that I knew and trying to find ways to be useful wound up at the Tesco Center down in Shemesh, 
in Poland, which is a notorious place for anybody that might be listening to this who's been here. And just got my start down there with that crew running eight into the country and got connected with Julia trying to buy my first van. And I was helping her get equipment for her friends who were in the military and she was hooking me up with jobs to do and people to evacuate and all those kinds of things. And then the rest is kind of history from there. My origin story is much simpler. I'm Polish, so this was happening right over our border. And I actually was switching jobs. And my last day on my previous job was the first day of a full-scale invasion. So I ended up sitting in my office on my last day, just watching the news and seeing what's happening, calling all of my, my friends, reaching out to them, telling them that if they want to evacuate, How can I help them? What can I do for them? Obviously, my apartment was uh, open to all of them. And that's exactly what happened. I helped to evacuate some of my friends and their friends. They stayed with me for a while. And because of that, I was uh, a part of all of Facebook groups centered around help for Ukraine. And I saw all of those pleas for help, all of needs and people looking for rights, either into the country or out of the country. And in the meantime, I made some friends who were driving aid into Ukraine. And that's how I met Chris. And I was basically the dispatch point because I spoke Polish. I speak English. I spoke barely any Ukrainian, but still could communicate with them. And we were getting aid into the country first to whoever it needed, then to our friends. And then I also found out that one of my close friends joined the fight with the Legion. So we were helping him for a long time. And then in September, I was laid off from my job, uh, the new job that I started. And I gave myself three months to see if I put a full time, full eight hours, which of course ended up being 12, 13, 15, into this instead of my job, if that's going to massively change our situation. And it did. So I just said, okay, let's keep going. And that's how this all evolved into what you see right now. How has volunteering here changed over the past two years? What are the current challenges that you face? I would say that we experienced a big change in the volunteer community in terms of amount of people that come out here. There was a big boom for the first year. Everybody wanted to come out here and help, and that has definitely slowed down. The biggest challenge currently is fundraising and getting aid in kind. Our operation was majorly based on all of in-kind donations that we have been receiving through the Polish NGO and through other cooperating NGOs all over Europe. And that has significantly slowed down since the beginning of this year and even the end of last year. So we are currently buying a lot more aid than we were in the previous year. And that definitely has put a strain on the budget situation. Luckily, there's still a lot of people engaged and wanting to donate towards Ukraine, but it's not as massive as it was last year. How do you talk to people about that? How do you persuade them, try and persuade them to come out if fewer people are paying as much attention? So we have a pretty stable team right now that is here either full time, nonstop or in like waves or two, three, five months. So we don't really need that many people anymore. We have some people contacting us on social media that want to come out here and then we interview them. The process is pretty long and the training process to become a volunteer here full time is pretty long. So we just pick people who want to stay here long term. When it comes to general visibility, we run a pretty active Twitter account and that's our primary social media. So you're based in Butcher now, is that that right? Yeah, yeah, we are based out of Bucha, but we primarily work in Donbas, in Kharkiv and Kherson regions. We've spoken to lots of people today and one man told us that, because we asked how has Bucha changed, what is left to do, and he said, well actually it shouldn't all be about us echoing what you're saying, that there's many, many thousands of villages that have suffered enormously, whose names the world don't know, but we all do know Butcher because of the massacres that happened here and the media reaction and, and everything. I just wondered, would you agree with that? Is that what you're trying to do? You're trying to go where nobody else is looking? Is that fair? For sure. Our whole identity out here was helping small villages that do not get much help. We were always helping little communities 
uh, one of our first big projects was uh, helping a village in Kharkiv region, very close to Russian border. And we always try to look for people who do not get international aid into their communities. Chris, you mentioned the sort of, it's not just the places that haven't been served or helped, it's also the people from different backgrounds that need certain products, need certain bits of help that is otherwise unavailable. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, certainly. So one of the reasons that we choose to function the way that we do, and we're at a fairly good size, I think, operationally for what we can handle right now. But the reason that we choose to keep it tight and nimble is because when we go to these places, we talk to the locals, we talk to the people, we ask how many elderly do you have in the village, how many children, and we try to find out like specific needs for that village. And then we also do take special requests. So quite often we have people reaching out to us or we'll meet people in those villages near the front line that say, hey, I haven't been able to get a hold of this medication for months or I haven't been able to to get a hold of this for months uh, or since before the invasion. And we round out on those things. We make sure that those people are taken care of or we work in conjunction with uh, some of our local partner organizations out in Kharkiv or out in Donbass or down in Kherson or Mykolaiv or wherever that might be to try to give them the resources to make sure that those people are taken care of properly. So we've got quite a good network down in the south and out in the east. And it's amazing to me that We're two years into the war and there's so many aid efforts out here and there are still places that we go that they say, hey, you guys are the first Western aid group that we've seen, that uh, you guys are the first Western aid group that's come out here, uh, or in some cases, the first humanitarian aid group, period. So, And that's not really an accolades thing for us. It's just surprising to me. A year, 18 months ago, it wasn't as surprising, but now for sure, it's just, it's tragic that, and really... The terrain and the geography of this place, especially out in Donbass, is the roads are all mud or they've got grad rocket holes in them or they're unpassable for one reason or another. Um, or you might have to argue with checkpoint guards a little bit to get through and, and they're kind of hesitant to let a groups go in and actually get to these people. But we make a point to go that extra mile and make sure that those people are taken care of. Are there any moments in the past two years that you've been especially proud of the team and especially proud of what you've done? I mean, I'm proud of all of them every day. And I think what we are doing is very important. And what we built from scratch is pretty impressive, if if I can say so. We have run several projects that were very important. One was down in Kherson. We were rebuilding a house for an older lady. Chris can tell you more about this project because he was the primary lead. But that was specifically a very, very proud moment when we could help a small community and a particular family get back on their feet after some tragic events. I think also our whole operation in Kherson after the dam was uh, destroyed, that was pretty, pretty impressive as well. We, in 12 hours, put together a couple of vans of aid and, and scrambled every resource we could and just went down there to help whoever we could. Chris, would you tell us a, bit, a little bit more about that house? What was your experience for building, rebuilding that house for the older lady? Sure. So that was a extremely special thing for us. I think it's probably the first time that we've actually gone down and lived in one of the communities that we serve for an extended period of time. And you know, we were out in this tiny village, pretty much, uh, I don't know, 30 kilometers, well, probably not even 20-ish kilometers away from the Dnipro River in Kherson region. And it was one of the areas that was really heavily affected by the flooding after the Hukovka disaster. And when we got there, we just started looking around and we had a budget that was left over from doing our aid work, our disaster response work. And we said, hey, we're going to go out to some of these areas that are far flung, that are not immediately in Kherson City, which is being more than well taken care of, and just try to find anybody that uh, might not have that extra set of hands to do the work. And the thing is, this the rural sectors of Kherson region are populated mostly by elderly people, or people at least in their 50s or 60s being the youngest demographic that's out there. And so there are quite a few people in a lot of those communities out there that just they don't really have the opportunity to help themselves and the village is quite poor to begin with and they don't have a lot of resources. So we managed to go out there and find a village that we helped uh, supply a few things for a couple of projects that they had to do to rebuild a few things in the town. 
And then they dropped us off at Nadia's house. And we took a walk inside and we met Nadia and sat down and had dinner with her and talked with her about her experience during occupation and during the flooding. And just every time we hear these kinds of stories, it's difficult not to get desensitized to a certain point, but it's still just shocking. It's unbelievable what these people have had to endure over and over and over again. But over the course of about a month, we reconstructed the interior of Nadia's home and did a bunch of work to the exterior to make sure that it was safe and, and warm for the winter. And we all have a new grandmother down in down in Kherson region. It was absolutely fantastic and really brought the team closer together. I think that it was one of those things where we've always sort of just gone as fast as we can. And we do have little breaks here and there, you know, where we hang out at the house or have barbecues or do whatever just to kind of relax and unwind and regroup but to be out there living in the community that we were serving and getting to know the people and experiencing the culture which is something that even though we're here we don't really get an opportunity to do a lot because we're just wrapped up in all of this all the time so it was really quite quite a magical thing for us and it brought the team a lot closer together in fact one of our teammates brogan who is from scotland she and Nadia have a particularly beautiful relationship. And the funny thing is Nadia can't say Brogan's name. So she just calls her Broccoli. <laughs> and, yeah. And if Brogan is here right now, she'd probably be crying at, at that. But no, they talk and text back and forth all the time. And we are planning to go back out there. We wanted to before the holidays, but everybody left a little bit too early to make that happen. So we're planning another trip back out there to see them and check on their needs and stuff in the next couple of, well, weeks to a month or so. How many different nationalities do you have represented in your teams? I counted at 1.20. Internationally speaking, if you're looking at the American side, we've got, I believe, eight members that have been doing a lot of work for us in the background, whether it's on the board or doing some other type of coordinating work. It's been as high as 15. At one point, we were all crammed in a house, which wasn't great, but we survived. We've got probably another 10 or, gosh, I don't know, how many in Poland, do you think? Mm, probably around 10, yeah. Probably around 10. Yeah. And then a couple of people up in Estonia. We've got several people out in the UK. And, uh, you know, people are have kind of attached themselves to our group either because we've worked on a project together before or because they've had direct involvement with us on the ground or just decided hey i want to get i want to become active in what you guys do and support what you do and that's really who we are is this open forum open source type aid group you know if you have a skill if you have willpower if you have the ability to be useful and the heart to stick with it then by all means, like we'll take you on, we'll find something for you to do. And so we've grown from six people running around in beat up old vans to probably 40 or 50 plus international volunteers. Before we start to wrap up, can I ask one of the biggest frustrations for you at the moment? Oh, um, this is not going to be very politically correct of me, but the Polish strike about grain and border blockades, that's definitely... Uh, a struggle for us currently. We've experienced quite a lot of delays because of that. We all get it, why they are doing this, but does it disrupt our work? Yeah, for sure. I would say another frustration is definitely some of the bureaucracy out here and in Poland as well. We very often come up against different challenges with bureaucracy, not being able to get more than one car into the country, even though we have a fleet of 13. 13. Or one of our volunteers is currently stuck in Poland because he got a speeding ticket that was paid, but wasn't processed correctly. So things like that, but there's no challenge we cannot overcome at some point. How do you ensure that you're doing everything by the book legally? I mean, throwing lots of people together for different skills who've not maybe done this before, that might throw up some challenges like that. How how do you ensure that it's sort of all present and correct? Yeah, so none of us have done this before. (laughs) And it it was really scary when we went from, hey, let's fundraise on Spot Fund and GoFundMe. And it was a lot simpler back then to all of a sudden, you know, hey, we want to do bigger projects, we want to take on bigger things. So we founded the 501c3 to start, which has its own reporting requirements and things like that. And then we had the need to start the Polish Foundation for 
bureaucracy reasons mostly <laughs> and to help with garnering that in-kind aid donation stuff that Julia was talking about. And then we also absorbed a existing Ukrainian organization. So our transparency as an organization functions on the fact that we are held to the requirements of three different nations with different reporting requirements. And we have built our system to be as redundant as possible to pander to all of the specifics of each of them. So the United States is probably the least restrictive, followed by Poland, followed by Ukraine. And Ukraine gets down to the point where you have to record your mileage and your fuel consumption for each trip and where you go and how much you spent. And that's just, you know, if we drive down to Donbass to go deliver aid, we have to track that mileage, we have to report that mileage, and then have a financial value associated with that mission to report to the tax office in Ukraine. Luckily, that's part of the benefit of having the Polish Foundation is all of our vehicles are registered to that foundation, so we don't quite have that requirement, and all of the funding comes from the United States organization. So all of our work within the country, everything that you see in this warehouse is on their balance. And so that's great for them. They get all of our resources and funding and those kinds of things, and we are able to function legally and appropriately within this country and within Poland. And by doing all of that, it ensures that the U.S. nonprofit remains autoproof as well. As far as the people aspect as well, it's 3XR as a coalition organization, as a ground team, on paper is not a legal entity. It's, it's just the group. Everybody comes out here and understands there's risks involved. And we do everything that we can to try to make sure that they are properly equipped, properly trained, and that we set expectations for how we conduct our operations to make sure they're not going to get into either legal trouble or physical harm, barring unforeseen rocket attacks, barring all those kinds of things. But our operational philosophy is very much, if there is a way to get the job done that does not require us to put our people in harm's way, uh, or anybody else for that matter, then we will do that. Uh, and we very often do put ourselves in harm's way, but it's, it's a calculated risk every time we go and do those things. And everybody that's here has a say in how that operation runs, has a say in how the organization runs, and whether or not they participate. Just very quickly then, you've been in harm's way before. Could you give us any more detail? What, does that, what might that look like? So overall, pretty much anywhere within about 30 to 50 kilometers of the actual frontline fighting, you are in an area where there could be surveillance drones. They can reach you with rockets. Uh, certain artillery platforms can reach 30 to 40 kilometers from the front line as well. There's also groups infiltrating now, especially within 30 kilometers of the front line, to try to sabotage and take out vehicles that are on the road that they can identify as aid convoys, whether that's humanitarian or military, they don't care. So those kinds of threats exist nonstop pretty much when we're doing our work. So. We have to pay attention. We have to listen to the checkpoint guards. We have to talk to our contacts within the military whenever we're going into a sector that we know is going to be particularly hot and make sure that we're not going in at a time where there's likely to be really heavy activity. And they know. I mean, they, most of the time, it's not like these things are scheduled, but, you know, there's intelligence circles or whatever that they've got going on in the background that can say, hey, today's not a good day. <laughs> but um, we probably once a quarter come into a situation where there's a lot of really intense activity going on. May of 22 with the original team on our very last day in Kharkiv, we actually got a direct hit of artillery and rocket fire. So we ended up conducting first responder trauma care on, I think it was six people, including one person who lost his life and several limbs, unfortunately and several other people who had shrapnel wounds that we were able to tourniquet or bandage appropriately. So that was a hell of a day. But times like that are few and far between, and we specifically structure the way that we work to make sure that that does not happen again. <laughs> We've learned a lot. Could you just tell us, just to finish? The logo? The logo. <laughs> you know what I'm going to ask? So just to describe the logo, we've got a raccoon holding a sort of a baton, and the colours of the Ukrainian flag on the tail. He's holding a sort of a bin lid as a shield, a pot as a helmet, and with some body, with some sort of wooden body armour. Can you explain what we're looking at? Why did you choose this? Yeah, so uh, back when we were getting the group together, I think it would have been early May of 2022, we were 
talking about putting a Facebook group together and starting to fundraise as a group. And we're like, hey, we need a name, we need logo. And the name, I think, started to come together first. And one of our original founding members, Drew, threw out there. He's like, yeah, we're the disaster trash pandas. We've been cleaning up Putin's mess since 2022. And that stuck. So Julia drafted one of the first logos that we had that was unfortunately copyright protected. But the raccoon thing came from that story and it stuck with us as just a symbol of who we are, really. We started out as this organization that just, we knew that there was an enormous amount of aid either sitting on the border in Eastern Poland or in Western Ukraine that was not being forwarded out to the places that needed it the most. And so we made it our job to go try to track that stuff down and repurpose it and get it out to the people that needed it the most. Um, when the, the farther east you go, the more people need literally everything. And the fact that anything is sitting in warehouses not being forwarded to those people is absurd. So that is where the raccoon ideology came from. Thank you very much for showing us everything. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just £1 at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine The Latest. We'll sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website, where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it. To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Rachel Porter. And the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.